Hello again, dear friends. We continue our brief overview of navigational surgery and the basics of implantology. In the previous video, we stopped at open sinus lifting and uh, in general began to talk about osteoplastic surgeries. So let's take a closer look at why open sinus lifting is needed and how it is performed. Uh, let me remind you that open sinus lifting is necessary when there is a lack of native bone, meaning when the patient's own bone is insufficient to place a dental implant, because it simply won't hold there. That makes perfect sense. So how is it performed? Open sinus lifting is called open because the surgeon, by detaching the mucoperisteal flap, exposes the bone and creates what is known as a lateral approach. Next, using special instruments, some use a round burr, others use a piezo-surgical tool, they create a small window, or as it's called, a lateral approach in open sinus lifting. Then, with some gentle effort and special instruments, some have dedicated kits for this, others just use regular smoothers, they proceed further. In general, the task is to carefully and gently separate the mucous membrane, which is the thin tissue lining the inside of the maxillary sinus cavity from the underlying bone structure. The goal is to create a sort of space or gap between the mucosa and the bone, which is necessary to allow for further procedures or treatments to be performed safely and effectively. This space is then filled with a special bone graft material, which later transforms into bone. This is also called a bone graft. There are different types of these bone graft materials. We won't go into detail about that right now. What's important for us is to understand what happens in the end. And in the end, what happens is that if before the surgery we had a uh, rather wide mucous membranitis is also called the pneumatic type of sinus. Then, after the surgery, yes, the volume of the sinus is reduced, but now we have a certain space that allows us to place an implant there. If we are talking about surgical guides, then when performing an open sinus lift, we need to plan the guides as if there is already bone present in that area. But there's an important condition. If you are combining an uh, open sinus lift with uh, guided surgery, you must first perform the open sinus lift and only then prepare the implant site using the guide. Because if you mix up this sequence, the, the drill will go through the sinus and that won't be good. In other words, it will go through the Schneiderian membrane and damage it. That's why you must first do the open sinus lift and only then proceed with the guided surgery. Let me repeat once again. When we plan all of this in real guide, if we have an open sinus, we basically ignore the fact that there's no bone there. We just plan as usual without any reservations or second thoughts. This is different from, or rather unlike the closed sinus lift, which I'll talk about next. In the previous video, I believe we ended on the point that uh, if, for example, we have an implant that is eight millimeters long and the height of the native bone is six millimeters, then there's no need to do an open sinus lift. You can get by with a closed one. How does it go? How is it done? By the way, this isn't a very good illustration because, for example, if we've decided to do a closed sinus lift, then we don't make a lateral axis. That is, if in an open sinus lift we would have detached the tissue up to this point or so, here we simply raise a mucoperiosteal flap in the implantation area and the drill should stop one millimeter short. Usually it's one millimeter before reaching the sinus. In other words, with the help of a surgical guide, we can program the drill so that it stops one millimeter before the sinus. And if during an open sinus lift, we didn't pay attention to the fact that it would be an open sinus lift, then with a closed sinus lift, we already need to take this into account and understand what we're dealing with. Here, by the way, the picture is more realistic because thanks to the fact that the drill stops one millimeter before the sinus, 
we have a small space left, which is also called the roof. There is a small bone fragment that the doctor gently taps with an osteotom. You've probably, I don't know, if you've ever assisted, maybe seen that uh, there is an instrument called an osteotom. In fact, it's well, pardon me, a little rod, yes, that you tap with a mallet. So the doctor carefully chips off a small piece of bone, and this small piece of bone is um, still attached to the mucosa. And uh, we can mechanically lift uh, the floor of the sinus just a little by the specified one, two, or three millimeters, and some people probably lift it by four, and accordingly place the implant. So you can see that the implant is placed taking this elevation into account. If we didn't do this, the drill would just go right through the mucosa, and that wouldn't be very good. As you understand, the integrity of the mucosa must not be compromised, whether in open or closed sinus lifting. So I hope that's clear. To summarize once again, with open sinus lifting, we basically don't pay attention to it when planning guides. But with closed sinus lifting, we have to take it into account and uh, must stop the drill one millimeter before reaching the sinus. Now we'll talk about another type of bone regeneration, which is called guided bone regeneration. Most often it's done on um, the lower jaw. Well, not most often. That was... Uh, uh, mistake on my part. What I mean is, since we were talking about the upper jaw before, we can also talk about the lower jaw, what happens there. What happens is that um, the uh, alveolar ridge, that is the bone yuk specifically, for example, the body of the lower jaw, is quite significantly narrowed and uh, we don't have enough necessary space here horizontally to place an implant. So, for example, if we have an implant, let's say, with a, a diameter of 4 millimeters, and we measure the thickness of the ridge in a cross-sectional view, and it turns out to be about 3, it's clear that uh, something needs to be done about this. Usually, without going too much into detail, a mucoperiosteal flap is uh, performed. That is, uh, the flap is lifted from the vestibular, and, for example, the lingual side, and then a uh, so-called membrane is placed uh, along with uh, osteoplastic material known as a bone graft. Sometimes this procedure is combined with the implantation, and sometimes it is done as a separate delayed step. In other words, the bone is prepared first, and as a result, this is what we get. This is just so you know what this is, what can be done with it, and uh, what the main rules are here. Um, when planning, so to speak, implantation. It's important to understand that this membrane is placed on the vestibular side. Therefore, when uh, planning implantation with guided bone regeneration, or GBR, we need to leave a certain distance, to step back a certain distance from the lingual cortical plate, and uh, even if our implant is uh, half exposed, uh, it will still be covered by the membrane afterwards. So, when you see this kind of situation, for example, on a CT scan slice, you shouldn't place the implant right in the middle of this defect. Instead, you can uh, shift uh, the implant slightly, even exposing it more, but uh, taking uh, guided bone regeneration into account. And if earlier we were talking about surgeries aimed at, uh, let's say, increasing the volume of bone tissue, here I'd like to show a different situation. After all, osteoplastic surgeries are not only procedures aimed at increasing volume, but also at removing excess bone tissue. Yes, that happens as well. And uh, here is the most typical uh, example I've chosen, the lower jaw, to show you what this is and why it's necessary. There is a phenomenon known as the pop of Godon phenomenon, as it is uh, sometimes called. It is called delta, oh, sorry, delta. It is called dentoviolar extrusion. That is when, as you know, in a normal situation, all our teeth have their antagonist on the opposite jaw. When uh, an antagonist is lost, for example, if the upper antagonist is missing, then it affects the teeth on the lower jaw and vice versa. So what happens is uh, 
phenomenon where the tooth, excuse me for the terminology, I'll try to explain as simply as possible starts to grow. And dentoveolar extrusion occurs sometimes. Uh, it's not just the tooth itself that moves or extrudes, but uh, the bone moves along with it as well. That's it. Or the opposite situation can occur, for example, when a patient like, uh, in this case first, lost teeth in the distal chewing area and the bone resorbed because when there is no chewing load, the bone atrophies. And then a little later, uh, lost teeth uh, in, the, in the front area. This happened earlier. Because of this, the bone developed this kind of uh, contour. So here it is. Why can't we just leave everything as it is? Why do we need to remove the excess bone volume? Because if we leave it like this and uh, suture everything up well, place the implants and uh, suture everything uh, up, then in the end, the prosthesis will have this same shape. In other words, it won't be possible to make a flat prosthesis. I mean, uh, a flat base for the prosthesis, uh, regardless of the type. And here, the same principle applies as... I mentioned uh, when I was talking about implant axis. Any mechanical structure is best able to withstand a perpendicular load. For example, right now I have a, a table in front of me and uh, its legs are positioned perpendicular to the floor. They're not bent. My table isn't curved and all of this is done well unless we are talking about some kind of designer solution. So all of this is done so that uh, the structure can withstand uh, the load. That's why in order to extend the life of the prosthesis to extend the life of the implants to prolong their service life. Everything is made as straight and as flat as possible. But I'm talking uh, uh, specifically about the base of the structure, which is responsible for the construction itself, meaning uh, uh, its mechanical properties. And um, what uh, will get in the way of this actually is excess bone. That's why from the very beginning when we plan the surgery, and by the way, you will be doing this, and most likely we'll go over it later, specifically in the sandbox module, how uh, to make a basic template, which will also serve as a template for reduction. Basically, you will be measuring the required level of uh, reduction and uh, having a general idea of uh, what our plane will be the plane of the prosthesis, I mean, its internal part. And taking this into account, uh, we will then reduce the bone first virtually and then in reality. And if, once again, we take a screenshot from a real guide, it all looks something like this. We've drawn a sort of dish, so to speak, right? I most often call it a dish. Actually, this tool is called, in my, in my opinion, uh, volume splitting, but that's not important. What matters is that... Uh, this dish is flat. Um, essentially, it represents a plane that uh, separates uh, one part from another. So in this case, uh, as you can see, the excess bone fragments are above this level and uh, everything we need is below this level. Therefore, uh, the amount of reduction that needs to be done is marked here in pink. Once it is removed, we will have, you could say, a flat platform and naturally in this way, who will extend the lifespan, not only of the prosthesis, but also of the implant. I hope I managed to keep uh, the unnecessary talk to a minimum and explained all the most important theoretical points. Let me repeat once again, I am not claiming to cover all of implantology or physiology here. I tried to use the simplest terminology possible, but uh, nevertheless, I believe I have shown the basic fundamentals and my goal here was not just to show how things can be or just for general knowledge. Everything I have shown here in one way or another affects the creation of surgical guides which we will be making together in the real guide program and from time to time we will return to our theoretical section. I will be directing you back to it under certain conditions or in specific cases. So please, uh, if anyone didn't um, understand something, watch it again or write about specific situations in the comments and we'll go over them. I hope you enjoyed it. Give it a like. Let's keep going. See you in the next lesson. Bye-bye.